Hey, welcome back to another episode of Behind the Shield, where we're honoring uh, retired military and first responders. And I came across our guest today through Three of Seven Project and Chad Wright's podcast. Um, and I couldn't help but just be kind of enamored with and, and impressed by and just completely respect our guest and his perspective, his faith, the way he carries himself, his service for our country, and, and now what he's doing. So I can't wait to dig in, and I'm going to read a little bit about this guy. His name's Eli Crane. And like I said before, and it, it goes uh, first on the list, he's a man of faith and a family man. He is a retired Navy SEAL um, turned entrepreneur, and we are going to get into how that came about. Uh exciting story there continues to run one of the fastest growing uh businesses in the state of arizona right now uh, really uh focused on veterans and and giving back to his community and then he's also uh going after uh, a little bit of something making a difference in the political arena and i can't wait to get into that too so i want to formally uh welcome eli crane to the show hey thanks for having me i appreciate it yeah. So, hey, man, awesome to have you. Uh, it's awesome to see guys. Not only do we admire former, you know, retired military, especially spe special operations uh, folks, uh, but we also, you know, guys that get out into the civilian world and start businesses and then giving back to those veterans. Uh, man, talk about how, talk a little bit about your Navy career as a SEAL. And, and what I noticed is you joined like the week after 9-11. My question to you was going to be, where were you on 9-11 since we had the anniversary last month? And didn't maybe can you take us through the emotions attached to what you saw on that day and then leading up to you enlisting? Yeah, I was actually uh, about 20 minutes from where I'm filming this right now. Um, I was at the University of Arizona. I just started my senior year in college and uh, I'd actually just got done with an early morning PT called Ranger Challenge. And I uh, got into my little car, turned on the uh, ignition, and uh, I had my radio set to talk radio. And um, they were talking about the Twin Towers getting hit by a plane. And I was thinking, driving back to the home I lived in, and I was thinking to myself, that's odd, you know. And then, uh, and then they started talking about, hey, this looks like it, you know, kind of fishy, might actually have been an attack. And I, I went, you know, into the house. I was at uh, AGR fraternity house. I was living in that house at the time. It was like an agricultural fraternity, um, just a bunch, bunch of good old dudes. And uh, so I, I started waking guys up and I was like, Hey, you guys got to come check this out, man. Something's going, something's, something's going down. So I woke up everybody and uh, we watched the second plane fly into the uh, world trade center. Um, and then we watched him collapse like everybody else. And uh you know, I remember going through the emotions of it, you know, at first disbelief, you know, then a little bit of, uh, you know, anger, some sorrow, and then, you know, wanting to jump into the fight. And I remember, you know, we all sat around, you know, just, you know, everybody took, you know, took time off. Nobody was going to school. We just sat around in disbelief and in shock, basically. And then uh, the next day I called my parents and I told them, hey, I've decided um, I'm going to drop out of school and I'm going to go join the Navy and try and become a Navy SEAL. And, you know, it takes several days to process you in. I went down to the recruiter, um, you know, had to find the right one who was in a complete used car salesman. Um, but I, I believe my first day in the Navy was, uh, September, I think 21st. So it was about 10 days after, um, you know, 9-11 happened. I was actually, uh, in boot camp in Great Lakes starting my, my journey. Man, and <clears throat> what a journey that was. I mean, what, eight years as a SEAL? Um, yep. 13 years total, I guess, and, and then five deployments. Is that right? Um, yeah. And, and actually worked with, and I don't know if it was under uh, or just alongside Chris Kyle, right, from, um, of course, for those that don't know who that is, the movie American Sniper about his life. But uh, talk about the experience of maybe being under his – either mentorship or just team being a teammate with him and just kind of how that maybe impacted you. Yeah. Um, you know, definitely had an interesting career. Um, still team three was a great place to be. 
um, you know, at the time that I happened to come into the SEAL teams and uh, my, my second uh, platoon, if you will, uh, my first full platoon was uh, under Chris Kyle, the American sniper. And Chris was my LPO, the leading petty officer. And so there were 20 guys in that platoon, roughly. Um, and I was one of the five new guys that were in the platoon. So it was a pretty brutal, um, it was a pretty brutal ordeal for those of us new guys. Um, you know, Chris being the ringleader and then you know, a lot of the other guys in that platoon, uh, you know, they, they love to make sure that they wanted to make sure as a new guy that you knew your place. Um, and, uh, you know, it, there, there was definitely some tough love going on. You know, some people might call it hazing, but, um, you know, it was, it was a, it was a tough, it was a tough, uh, it was a tough two year period of my life because at the same time that I started working for Chris Kyle, you know, I had to walk on eggshells you know, uh, a lot of tough love going on at work. And then I also, my wife and I had our first child. And so I had a newborn when I got home who was actually sleeping in our room. So really stressful day job. And then, you know, come home and, you know, have a newborn keeping you up all night. And uh, honestly, I, there were times where I couldn't wait to go sleep in a bush somewhere, you know, and, and be back out in the field. So I could actually get a, you know, a couple hours of solid sleep, but you know, it's definitely a, a rough point in my life, you know, rough point in my life, but I'm thankful for it. I'm thankful that I got to, you know, work with a guy uh, like Chris Kyle and, and, and so many of the other guys in that platoon taught me so much and kind of helped me, um, you know, uh, understand what it was going to take to, you know, be a uh, productive mm -hmm. and valued member of the SEAL platoon. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because, I mean, you know, Navy SEALs are – are a, they're cut out of a different cloth and, and you guys really special operations in general. Um, there's no way to fully understand what you guys go through and what you're capable of. And, and I, I think it's just commendable that, I mean, even having a, you know, young child and, and fairly newly married, I'm assuming. And, and you're just kind of get trying to look, find your way. Um, were you, uh, just because we don't know each other that well, and I don't know your complete faith journey, but were you a, were you a believer, a Christian during that time, or was that something that came later? I was, and it actually ended up being really, uh, really helpful. You know, I, that's always been my bedrock, my foundation. In times of uh, difficulty and struggle, you know, where, you know, where, where it's easy to focus on the wind and the waves of life, you know, and and I, I'm grateful that I was, I actually was saved when I was seven years old. I was raised in a church. Um, uh, I'm, I'm grateful for it. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, that, that, that was a big part of my life. It's a, it's an even bigger part of my life today. I feel as if, as, as I've gotten older and I've, you know, chased a lot of things of the world and realize, you know, how they never lead to fulfillment and, um, you know, made a lot of mistakes and uh, got to see, you know, the Lord work in my life and in the life of my family and, and that of others. You know, it's just made me want to double, double, triple down on uh, my relationship with Christ and uh, trying to help others, um, you know, as, as they try and move towards, you know, towards the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. And if you're like me or a lot of people, I guess, as, as their Christian life journey kind of embark on that and and they there's a lot of ebb and flow with that and like you said chasing certain things of the world and then we kind of come back was there anything during your military experience that maybe there was an aha moment that kind of got you back on that track or you know you're kind of not that you're not a christian anymore but you, like you said it's yeah. it's a struggle to maintain a lot of those uh, disciplines and principles in certain environments you're in was there something that kind of went off in you that got you yep. back toward that going full miles and hundred miles an hour in that direction again. Yeah. And I, cause I think there's a, I think you can be saved and, 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 you know, and not necessarily having a close walk or relationship yeah. with God. Yeah. But um, yeah, I actually, uh, I actually went to a, a Christian men's retreat in 2016 and uh, it was called uh, ransom heart. It's the John Eldridge uh, okay. ministry boot camp. The guy that wrote the book Wild at Heart, the author, yeah. he does a boot camp up in Colorado, and usually it's about only four hundred guys get to go to it. Um, 
it, it, it's so competitive to get in that like there's a lottery and a buddy of mine uh, who, who owns a shark tank company, like I do, he kept asking me, he's, he's like, Eli, you got to come check this out, man. It changed my life. dude. It's one of the coolest things. And I was like, I don't know, man, a Christian men's retreat. That does not sound, <laughs> that does not sound awesome to me. And, uh, and so he just kept after me. And finally, you know, I knew that, I knew that there was some, I, I definitely had some, some issues and I still do, but, um, things that I needed to work on in my heart. And I knew that I was, I was broken, I was hurting. And, uh, you know, once I got out of the military and, um, and so I was like, you know what? I asked my wife, I was like, Hey, I want to go to this but we had the business at the time we had two young kids and I felt bad because it was like a four day thing and you couldn't have your cell phone on you. Um, they wanted you to completely disconnect from the matrix. And, uh, so it was a big app. I I said, Hey babe, will you let me go to this for my birthday? And so she agreed to let me go to it and, uh, it changed my life, man. It just, uh, you know, helped me, you know, it helped me see this, you know, this story that we live in, you know, and the warfare that surrounds it, Mm. you know, spiritual underpinnings, the spiritual surface, you know, uh, of all of it. And, uh, and it, it yeah. made me want to, it made me just want to engage, like it, it awoke in that warrior heart in me, that same heart, you know, that wanted to, you know, fight for something bigger than myself that made me say, Hey, um, the, the week after nine 11, I want to go serve my country and fight, you know, fight for those that can't fight for themselves. And, uh, the same warrior heart in me, you know, started stirring again and it made me want to go fight for marriages and, you know, and, and just my brothers who were broken, like I was, and Mm -hmm. that was, that was a big, a big event in my life. Yeah. I mean, and I would imagine the same warrior heart that leads to the fire getting started in you to, to go toward making a difference in Washington as well. Cause you have, it sounds like to me, you have this fire in your belly, to go and represent those who can't represent themselves, like you just said, and then fight that fight, the good fight, and and do it the right way. Uh, so, okay, so we talk a little bit, and I do want to come back to what you mentioned a second ago about some of the impact the military had on you and some of the brokenness you felt along the way that a lot of veterans feel. But, man, right. tell us this. We've all seen it on TV. We've all watched Shark Tank. We all know who Mark Cuban and Kevin O'Leary are. So, man... Tell us how you and your wife started this in your garage. It was just a blessing, man. Um, honestly, um, I remember when I was getting ready to get out of the military, I was I was praying. And, you know, I, I watched several of my buddies um, get out before I did who had the same qualifications that I did. Mm-hmm. You know, they were deals, they were snipers, whatever, whatever they were. And I watched these guys who are smart, they're really smart guys. They're go-getters, they're self-starters, you know, um, they, they're able to think outside the box. Challenges don't scare them. And yet these guys were struggling to find something, you know, to turn the page, you know, some, you know, something they could sink their teeth into. I'm not just talking about like, you know, flipping burgers somewhere. I'm talking right. about some, you know, um, you know, they could find that, um, what's the word I'm looking for here, that fulfillment. And, yeah. and so these guys were, it was taking them like a year, year and a half. And I was like, Oh man, this is, this is kind of, this is kind of scary, especially when you have dependents. Like I did, I had two little kids. And so um, I started praying and I was like, Lord, how do you want me to provide for my family when I get out? And um, a couple of years before I got out, you know, I, I started tinkering around with these uh, 50 cal bottle openers and uh, my friends loved them. And, but we, we didn't know where you could buy them in the States. And so I asked my wife, Hey, Jen, can you help me, uh, market these online, sell them online? Cause I was making them with the Dremel tool. I was cutting them with the Dremel tool, some spray paint and, uh, putting stickers on them. And they look, it looked pretty bad, but people still bought them. And, uh, and so it just kept growing and growing. And, uh, you know, before long, you know, I had like five or six guys working in my one car garage while I was a naval uh, while I was an instructor in the SEAL teams, mm. you know, so, um, you know, it was, it was a rough, it was definitely a rough period as Jen and I, cause that's, that's one, one thing, I'll, you know, uh, in the, when you're in the SEAL teams and if, especially if you're active in a platoon or something, you're gone about 270 days out of the year. So even if you're married 
and you mar- you get married to somebody, you know, while you're, you know, while you're doing that job, right. Before, most of us don't even know how to live together. Cause you're, um, you're gone so much. Right. Mm-hmm. So yeah. me and my wife were trying to learn how to live together, uh, raise two little kids. I've got a full-time job and we're, you know, from like eight in the evening when I get home to like two in the morning, we're, you know, running this, you know, exploding, you know, small, small business. And, you know, it was a really stressful time. And, uh, to the point that me and my both, my wife both had like ulcers, you know, for the first time in my life. So it grew more quicker than you thought it would sound. Oh yeah. Way, way quicker. And, and it was, I felt like it was answered prayer and I was just praying. I was like, Lord is even once it started growing rapidly, I was like, Lord, is this what you want me to do? Um, Cause I had learned a long time ago that if I'm not walking in the Lord's favor, that it yeah. doesn't matter, you know, how much money you're making or what the title is, mm-hmm. you know, you're, you're in the wrong spot and it's, yeah. you're headed, you're headed for a disaster. And so, um, so yeah, that, you know, he, he just continued to bless it. And, uh, and uh, we just continue to work on it and continue to grow it. And, and about two years later, we were on the show shark tank and we made a great deal and, We've done a lot of great work um, since then. We've come up with a lot of, you know, a lot of cool products, a lot of cool gifts for people. And, uh, you know, we've been able to do a lot of cool stuff in the, in the, at the same time by giving back to a lot of veteran nonprofits and hiring veterans. And for me, that's, it's mandatory. Like I'm the type of guy that if there's no mission in what I'm doing, then I can't even, uh, I can do it for five minutes before I'm, you know, bored or you know yeah taking a nap so yeah uh, you know it's been it's been a cool it's been a blessing and a cool journey and it was one that me and my wife had to learn to not only live with each other but work with each other and respect each other and so um yeah you know it, it's been a blessing in a lot of ways well i mean that's that's incredible because that's really every you know everybody who even had a had a a vision of something and creating something and building a business. Like that's the dream, what you just described, but it's not always roses, right? It's not always easy. It's probably never easy. Um, but have you always considered yourself kind of an entrepreneur? So for the audience that's out here listening and hears your story and thinks, man, this guy just had an idea, thought it would serve people. Didn't really think a whole lot, just kind of went after it and did it and then let, let God deal with the results. And so have you always had that sort of computer chip within you that was entrepreneurial or sell, you know, business owner type mentality? No. And I, I'm glad you asked me cause I, I love it. I love encouraging people whenever I get the chance. Um, I, I didn't, I thought I was too stupid to be an entrepreneur, honestly. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, maybe we can go into this for a second, but sure. you know, I think in that ministry that I went to the, the ransom heart ministry mm-hmm. and, you know, as guys, we don't, we don't talk about this stuff a lot, but um, you know, John 10, 10 says the thief has come to steal, kill and destroy. And first mm-hmm. Peter five, eight says be alert and of sober mind for your enemy. The devil prowls the earth like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Mm-hmm. And basically the bottom line is this, if you're born into this world, you're born into a world at war. You have an enemy who's trying to take you out constantly. Oh. And most of us, you know, it's impossible to, you know, grow up and become a man without, you know, um, suffering some wounds along the way. Um, and most of us we're just taught, Hey, brush it off. You know, don't worry about it. Especially if you, especially if you go to a community like I did in the SEAL teams where, I mean, it's, you know, it's you the toughest of up, the tough, right? You just, you just suck it up. It don't matter. You know, rub some dirt on it, get back yeah. in the, get back. In the fight. And you know, what I realized is that, um, you know, I, as I went into this ministry, one of the things they did was they took us back into, you know, um, our development, childhood, et cetera, and had us look for, you know, some of the wounds that we had suffered from. And I know this sounds like a big, you know, kumbaya session, but it was so beneficial. But one of the things I realized is that, you know, when I was, when I was younger, my brothers used to tell me all the time, you know, they used to tell me how stupid I was and how I was a big, you know, a big F up. I won't swear on your show, but sure, sure. 
you can figure out what what they were talking about. And so I you hear something enough and you start to think, oh, yeah, I am stupid. Yeah, I am. And I was never stupid. I just didn't I didn't apply myself in in school. I really didn't care. And therefore, that's, you know, one of the one of the buttons that my brothers would push on me. And I, I would I would dish it out just as much, probably more than, you know, than, than they would. So I'm not harping on my brothers. I love them. They're great dudes. But we we're all we're all we yeah. all do it. We're all we all lash out. When yeah, to go into survival mode, you know, everybody's yeah. kind of out, you know, having to stay afloat. And so to get back to your question, my I thought I, I thought I was stupid in certain in certain areas because I've been told that. And and I was and I always had, a I guess, a high level of respect for entrepreneurs and business owners. And I just thought I was too stupid to do it. And so thankfully, as I was getting out, the first business that I was a partner in, uh, it was another business and, uh, it was called Acumen Performance Group. And we, we took, you guys can go look them up online. It's acumenperformancegroup.com. We've yeah. worked with a lot of professional sports teams. We worked with a lot of collegiate sports teams. We've worked with a lot of Olympians, corporate groups, just you name it and teaching, um, some of the mental toughness, um, and, and just, uh, mentality, you know, that it takes to get through um, a SEAL program or a spe- ha- have that special operations type mentality. And it's obviously, it's a watered down program. We're not, we're not putting people through hell week or anything like that, but it was just really cool. And I kind of fell in love with the, you know, with, with the idea when I was asked to partner in this and be a part of it. And uh, that's where I caught the entrepreneurial bug because I, as I started to help these guys develop, you know, our curriculum. And then we started doing events with people and, you know um, you know, we, we got a, you know, a paycheck here and there. I was like, Oh man, this is awesome. And it was, a, it was challenging, but I loved the freedom and I loved that the potential upside was limitless. And I've always been the type of guy that like, I love to swing for the fences. I love to go big. And, you know, this, it, that's why I fell in love with entrepreneurship. And so a couple of years later, the bottle breacher um, opportunity slash idea came along and I was able to, uh, you know, help these guys for a couple more years before I, I got just too busy with bottle breacher that I had to part ways with them, but we're still good friends. And uh, that's kind of how, um, you know, this whole thing, this whole thing came to pass, but I, I want to encourage, you know, especially the guys in, in your audience, um, you know, we all, if, if you don't, if you don't go, if you don't go and address the wounds from your past, like I didn't, and that was just one of many, but it's like holding a beach ball underwater. Mm. You can hold your water for a little bit of time, but sooner or later that thing's going to come mm-hmm. fast, busting up, shooting out, and it's going to create so much havoc and so much chaos in your life. Um, you know, and, and, and the second part of that verse, um, that John 10, 10, that the, the thief has come to steal, kill and destroy is, but I have come that you might have life and have it to the fullest. And that's where I had to turn. I had to ask, I had to ask Christ to come into those areas of my heart. Yeah. I was dealing with all sorts of stuff at the time you know, a bunch of anger, rage, um, resentment, a bunch of stuff. And I had to ask Christ because it was just tearing me up. It was tearing up my marriage. Um, and and I was very walled off. Um, and, uh, I, I, I realized that I realized that I couldn't even, I couldn't even mourn friends of mine that were being killed overseas because, I'd built such massive walls around my heart as a defense mechanism. I was so tired of being hurt. I was so mm-hmm. tired of those wounds continually being jabbed that I was just like, I'm going to, I'm going to build, I'm going to fortify my heart and fortify my emotion to a point where I don't care anymore. And that's a really dangerous place to be. And I think a lot of guys get so tired of being hurt. They get so tired of constantly being let down they get so tired of this screwed up world that we live in that that's just what we do and then typically we just mask it we medicate it you know we yeah. find addiction whether it's alcohol or pornography mm-hmm. whatever whatever your mm-hmm. drug of is and it doesn't it never resolves the problem it just prolongs it and i just felt christ knocking on my heart and it you know i just that's the thing i noticed too like you know a lot of times we know we're in trouble, but we won't let Christ come in 
into mm-hmm. certain areas because we think we need those areas or those things or those addictions in our life. And I was like, Lord, I just want you to, I just want you to clear it all out. I want you to yeah. just a renovation in my heart. I want you to make it new. Yeah. And, uh, and man, it just changed, it changed my life. And uh, I'm so, I'm so grateful. And I was able to, I was able to start living with the whole heart again, but I yeah. had that couldn't do, it was something I couldn't do on my own. I tried everything, man. I tried, I tried the money. I tried, you know, I chased mm-hmm. money. I ch- idol i chased affirmation you know i became a navy seal at 25 i became an, a millionaire at 35 i had the beautiful wife i had the beautiful family and none of it did, none of it filled that hole in my soul that yeah. hole of, it can only be filled by god and so yeah and i would step in to say too is because i'm glad you said something a minute ago about how it, it created that friction you know trying to keep that beach ball under the water and not address certain things. And I would imagine that's a common theme amongst military veterans. And some of the reasons I would, I don't have the stats in front of me, but I would imagine the divorce rate's pretty high when people come back from war, a war or a combat zone. And, and they've not only have they not dealt with some of the issues from childhood or their past, but the war issues that they've dealt with in the military, they probably, I mean, just another, that, that beach ball just keeps getting bigger and, and it, you can't keep it under the water, like you said, but I would imagine that caused some tension in, in your marriage, like you said, and then other people's marriages, it just kind of compounds itself. If we don't get in front of it and, and address it, like you said, and I hope that people are hearing this and I hope there's, I know there's good at organizations out there getting with military veterans that are getting them to express and, and sort of open up about it. Cause we all can agree guys are reluctant to do that. But um, man, as we kind of, I'm glad you said a lot of that stuff is going to encourage people because man, they love people love to hear uh, from a, a real world scenario of somebody who's not only been successful, but significant. I think there's a difference. And I think you've taken your success and become significant because you've made it about other people and pouring into others and encouraging others and serving others. So I think people are really encouraged by that message because they can relate. And I love your relatability on that. And as we kind of transition to your, the politics of it and, and you being a congressional candidate, uh, I think I read something and uh, that where you said you kind of got, and I'm paraphrasing, but you kind of got tired of griping about all the things that were wrong and yep. just said, well, you and your wife decided, well, let's, let's do something about it. And then, you decided to step into the political arena, man, I, you must have gone back and forth in your mind a lot on whether or not you really wanted to jump in with both feet on that. So what was the deciding factor and what were some of the things you toiled with along that, that journey of making that decision? Yeah, no, well, thank you for asking. Um, you know, the, one of the biggest toils for me was, is it, it after, you know, after God started just knocking at the door in 2016, you know, and like we, we read in Proverbs 320, um, it changed, like I said, it changed my heart. It changed my life. It changed my focus. I was no longer really hyper-focused on entrepreneurship and business like I had been in the past. Um, and I thought, I thought God, you know, over the next couple of years, I continued to work on myself. I continued to work on my marriage, Um, I continue to, you know, just seek him more and more and what it led to, I I felt like God was calling me into ministry Mm. and I actually started putting my resume in like calling people that were involved in ministries and asking, Hey, do you guys have any opens openings? You guys have any internships, you know, that type of thing, just searching for an opportunity to serve in that capacity. And, Um, and then, uh, last year it, it, oddly enough, I got a phone call. I was in New Hampshire at a Sig Sauer event. Um, I'm a brand ambassador for Sig Sauer firearms. And, uh, I got a phone call while I was up there and it was a state, um, state representative here in Arizona. And he asked me, he's like, Hey, Eli, can you do me a big favor? He said, um, I need somebody to make a, a business owner, uh, to make a commercial with Martha McSally, Senator Martha McSally at the time. And I was like, well, let me, let me, let me pull her up online, take a look at, you know, her website or her policies, all that. And then the, the guy that, uh, they actually wanted me anyway, long story short, I made this commercial for Martha McSally and, uh, it went, went over really well. I got to talk with Martha. She's an, she was an air force pilot. Mm. Um, she, and the, she, I think she was like the first woman to fly like a combat mission or something oh, like wow. that in, 
an A-10. So pretty, very impressive woman. Um, and then she, then she ran for Congress, be, became a Congresswoman. And then, and then she, um, and then she uh, was a Senator here in Arizona and when I met her and she actually asked me, she's like, Hey, Eli, she was in my office right here. I was sitting right here and she's like, Hey, I want you to run for Congress. And I was like, yeah, my wife was in the room and I was like, yeah, well, you know, you got to talk to my wife over there. And Martha looks at <laughs> like, Hey, and Jen, my wife's like, what are you guys laughing about? And, she, and uh, Martha's like, no, seriously, I want Eli to run for Congress. And my wife was just jokingly, she was like, well, you know, if I can quit my job working for him at, at Bottle Breacher, then maybe we can talk about him running for Congress. But, and so we just left it at that. And Martha left and um, she ended up losing uh, the, the, uh, the race uh, to Mark Kelly. Um, but then about five months ago, I believe, I, uh, the, the people that were behind Martha, um, in Washington, some, one of them reached out to me and said, Hey, Eli, I want you to really think and consider about running for Congress. And if you're, if you're willing to do it, we'll get behind you. We'll help you with everything that you don't know about. We'll help you build a team. And so my wife and I, Jen, you know, they flew out, uh, to Arizona to meet with my wife and I, we talked with them. Um, it was a good conversation. Um, and then I said, I'll get back to you. I need to pray on this and think on it. And, uh, it was interesting because my wife, who's usually risk averse, I'm usually the, Hey, let's jump into the right. deep end and figure it out. And she's usually like pulling me back and it makes kind of creates a cool balance, you know? Yeah. And I think, I think God gave her to me for a, re a certain reason. Mm -hmm. Um, but she was like, Hey, what's, what's, what's wrong. Usually if you got an opportunity to do something like that, you would, you know, you'd be all over it. I don't understand why you're, why you're taking so much time to think about it. And I was like, you know, babe, I was like, um, I really felt like God was calling me to ministry and uh, this doesn't look like ministry to me. Um, and, uh, I feel torn honestly, because I know my country's in massive trouble. I know it's yeah. in trouble. Yeah. I know we need leaders you know, in politics. And I felt, I feel like a lot of Christians have avoided mm -hmm. leadership in those areas. And I think it's a, I, honestly, I think it's been a massive mistake we've made. Mm -hmm. And I know that we're called not to uh, uh, conform to the ways of this world, you know, however, we have to live in this world and our kids yeah. have to grow up in this world. And so I think that as Christians, we should be engaged in all forms of, uh, in all forms of leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, and so anyway, my wife asked me that question and I told, I gave her the answer and uh, she, you know, she responded, she said, Eli, she, and this was one of the coolest things my wife's ever said to me. And she said, Eli, the, the, the best ministry I've ever seen you do is not been in church. It, you know, sometimes it's at a restaurant, sometimes yeah. it's in a bar friend of yours. Sometimes it's just hanging out, you know, sometimes it's just hanging out. And uh, she said, do you not think that God would put you in front of people that he wants, that he's yeah. going out their heart? if you go to Washington and I said, you know what, babe, you're right. You know, God, you know, God could use me there as well. And so we decided, um, you know, we decided, Hey, let's give this a shot. Yeah. And I say that, you know, and I, I know full well that God's plan might not even be, um, that I'm supposed to be a Congressman, but I, you know, I, and I think, I know the Lord works in mysterious ways and I know his, his timetable is not always our timetable, mm -hmm. but I, I do believe that I'm, I do believe that I'm following him. I believe I'm stepping out in faith here. Mm -hmm. uh, you run for Congress. You, you don't get, you're not getting paid for it. Like, yeah. you know, and I'm grateful to be in a spot in my life where I don't, you know, I don't have to be getting paid for it. Um, but you know, it definitely does, you know, it, it, you definitely have to step out in faith and leave, you know, that, that branch that you're hanging on to and you have to completely let go and you have to, you know, you have yeah. to say, this is what you want me to do. I know that no matter what happens, you're going to provide for me. You're going to, you're going to take care of me and you're going to grow me. And so yeah. that's that dude. Yeah, man. I, and I think we're all in ministry. Honestly, we don't need pastor um, beside our name on a business card to be in ministry. And I think that's where some of the people maybe miss, some of their calling because they feel like they got to be within the four walls of the church to be doing ministry. And I think we're all doing it on a daily basis. And what better platform than where it's most needed right now, where I think, and, and that's in Washington, you know, I think people like you and, and different 
former mil, you know, retired military people that are doing what you're doing and getting in that arena and throwing their name in the hat and, and just stepping out, man, I got asked though, like whenever you were presented with that as a possibility um, and you got that phone call and the people came and visited you and sort of, you know, maybe pinned you down a little bit to make a decision and really encourage you on that. Had you even given any thought to the policies that are your main focus right now? Like, had you kind of already had these plugged in a pipeline in your head as to where you think we need the most reform the quickest? And because I know, you know, let me go off of a couple of your focuses being border patrol, you know, border control and, and securing our borders and, and, and term limits, if I'm correct, and, and just different things with law enforcement and former military focus. Uh, did you already have those sort of plugged into your uh, business plan, if you will, as a congressman? You know, I, I, I did. And the, my, my, um, you, you hit one of them, you know, uh, border, border security is a massive deal mm-hmm. in the United States, but it's even a bigger deal here in Arizona because we are mm-hmm. a border. Um, but um, the election integrity is actually the, my top issue. And it's the top issue that I hear constantly when I travel around on the campaign trail. And I'm just talking to people about, hey, what are you concerned about? People are also really concerned about uh, massive government overreach when it comes to COVID, yeah. COVID-19. And I've been following this stuff for a long time. I'm not one of these guys, you know, I, I want to be clear on something. I don't think that, yeah, I don't think that we're ever going to build a utopia here on earth. Sure. I think that that's only going to happen when Christ comes back. But I do believe that we should try and not only, yeah. uh, you know, be a good witness, but I believe that, you know, we should try to um, give people the opportunity um, and the freedom to live, you know, live life the way that they want to live it. And as I look over the course of history, I realize that, you know, that opportunity that we have here is very unique. And, you know, most of the time throughout history, if you study it, you know, ideals are peaceful and history is violent and it's full of all sorts of, you know, Mm -hmm. dictatorships and tyrannies and, you know, men, you know, scrapping and squabbling and killing for power. I mean, power. And, you know, I obviously think, you know, all of it has, you know, spiritual connotation and foundation to it. But I think that, you know, one of the things that we, you know, those of us called into it should be doing is trying to make sure that, um, you know, people have the opportunity to be free. And, uh, you know, that's why I love our, you know, our declaration of independence and our constitution, you know, that shows us that our rights are unalienable. They're God given. Mm -hmm. They're not, they're not given by government. And, you know, you wouldn't know that if you, you know, turned on the news, you know, and, you know, you don't, you don't, there's no more understanding or, or belief that our rights are you know, God given, I mean, let alone, we push God out of every institution, country, push prayer out of everything. And not only that, but we've, you know, it's almost like, it's almost, to me, it's a demonic spirit. If God says, Mm -hmm. I created the male and female, the world, the world goes the exact opposite way. And it perverts everything that God says. And, you know, you know, as I study the Bible, um, you know, that, that's what the Bible says will happen yeah. in this, this world. So I get it. I understand it, but that doesn't mean that to me, we just sit around and, and, you know, we don't, we don't fight, we don't fight it. We don't, um, yeah. you know, we don't. some of the things that made this country great were, was the ingenuity and innovation and creativity that we allowed people to have. And some of the autonomy that was allowed early, you know, even in the last, I don't know, you go back, prior to the last 20 years or 30 years, you know, we, we've had these entrepreneurs and just this great innovation. Uh, and I feel like, like you said, it, it seems like we're getting a little stifled in that department among other departments where we're being sort of, like you said, overreached, uh, from the government. So I, I, let me ask you this and, and being respectful of your time, I want to maybe ask one or two questions, but, uh, more questions, but so, if you are, and, and I, I don't, I haven't had anybody that's actually a congressional candidate on here yet. So this question really applies to you, but what, what if we, we get a phone call 
you get a phone call tomorrow and, and this is a hypothetical and that's okay. We'll have a little fun here. Uh, we're going to speed up this whole process and fast track you to the white house and the oval office. So you get a phone call, you're president for a day or yeah. maybe two, it might take longer than a day to make those changes, but let's say you don't have any red tape to go through. You don't have any approvals. You don't have to get votes. You just make a couple of decisions and it's done immediately real time. What are the, what's one or two, <laughs> I know you got a list, but what's one or two you can pin down that if you were president tomorrow, that you would plug in immediately, one or two things? Well, I think one of the first, the first thing that I would do, you know, um, is I would draft, I would probably try and draft up some legislation um, that dealt with um, election reform. Um, and I think that's, I think that's so, I think it's so important. I think our elections have um, intentionally been loosened up to create the opportunity for fraud. Sure. I know a lot, you know, people are really divided on this, uh, the, the issue mm -hmm. of election integrity. Is there an, you know, is there a need for it? Or, you know, I've, I've heard a lot of people say our elections mm -hmm. are the most transparent and accurate and perfect, you know, elections we've ever had. I personally don't believe that. I believe there's a lot of evidence to suggest the contrary. Sure. And at the, at the end of the day, let's let's say, just since we're you know in a hypothetical here that that I'm wrong. Let's say I'm uh -huh. wrong. Let's say that they are the, the the most perfect elections that we we ever could ever have. There's no fraud. Um, I'm basically trying to tighten up something that doesn't need tightened up. And you know, it's it's like what what harm does that do yep. to try? Sure that like your elections are tight and um, that nobody's vote cast you know outweighs anybody else's vote and that nobody's um, you know throwing throwing votes into the count that aren't authentic votes and therefore cancel out your authentic yeah citizen the gray, so the gray areas yeah. become a sketchy area now so that you know, election integrity because I look at this is like. I look at this as like uh, national triage. I look at this as what's going to kill us first, right? If we don't get our elections, if we don't get our elections tightened up and um, legitimate again, it, it's not going to matter. It's not going to matter what candidates you run. They could be the greatest candidates in the world. It's not going to matter how much money you raise. None, none of it will matter. And I, I, one of the t one of the dictators said that it doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter who you get to vote for you. All that matters is who you get to count the votes for you. Right. Wow. It doesn't, and, and it's so true. It's like, and, and it's, it's so sad to me that we're so complacent and so ignorant as Americans. We, it's almost like we think there there's this, you know, protective shield up, upon us that could never be, um, that could never be tarnished or penetrated. Right. Right. So we just be complacent and, you know, watch our Netflix and, you know, take our vacations and, and never, you know, never tune in or pay attention to what's going on. And it, yeah. it's really unfortunate because complacency often, you know, breeds destruction and, well, and that's what be going on. So I would definitely, you know, work that's on a point. Yeah. That's a point of hemorrhage in your opinion for the country right there. That's where the hemorrhage is really starting. Yeah. And then, and then I think one of the, the next biggest threats to our country is our national debt. Um, you know, it, and I know that sounds like weird, but like um, we have like over $30 trillion in debt. And if you're paying attention to what's going on um, in Washington right now, they're trying to tack another, you know, 3.5 trillion sure. on top. Um, it's, it's going to, you know, it's creating inflation. Your dollar is not going to be worth as much anymore. Your buying power is not going to be worth as much. No. Nope. And it's really, it's, it's really unfortunate. And it's really sad too, because none of us, I can't run my business that way. You can't run your household that way, but because there's no accountability and because we're so complacent and we don't hold our elected officials to account, they can do it and just keep getting reelected. And all they have to do is come back to you and say, Hey, Oh, Hey, look, I got you this I got yep. you this project, you know, I got you this special interest project, you know, so I'm, I'm really fighting for you. But at the end, what, what these guys are really unwilling to do is they're unwilling to take a hard vote 
like if if everybody's having a good time you know nobody wants you know and and you know everybody's buying gifts and goodies nobody wants to be that that individual that comes in and says hey guys the party's over we've got to stop we got to take some of that stuff back sure we've got, we've got to have a yard sale because we're in, nobody wants to be that that guy and politicians are the same way they want to say yes and they want to tell you they're going to do all these nobody wants to nobody wants to make the hard decision and you know that that's one of the things that if if I was president for the day and and had no red tape. That's something that, you know, I would get the smartest people around me to help me figure out a way to get that in check. And that's just two, that's just two of like hundred that we yeah, can go over. That, I mean, that's, that's a great analogy when you said it, like giving gifts and then we got to take it back because we got out, out over our skis and overextended financially. Now party's over. We got to take all this stuff back. That's a great analogy. Cause it's, it's spot on, man. What are they going to do? I mean, we'll just throw us another stimulus package to make everybody happy. Um, and, and, you know, I know that the stimulus packages have their place and certain deg- to certain degree, but I think now we just become entitled to those. Um, so, Man, I, we could talk for hours because I, I think, I mean, how do, what's the time frame on you getting elected? Because we need to get a lot more Eli Cranes in, into Congress. So what can people do to help you? I mean, obviously we're in, I'm in Texas, but if people are in Arizona, I mean, what can we do to kind of get behind you? And what's the time frame on seeing this come to fruition for you? No, I appreciate that. Um First, let me say this. It's not about me. It's never been about me. It won't be about me. Thank sure. God this, this story that we live in is not about me. Um, but I will say that one thing is encouraging um, on that same wavelength is that there are, I believe, seven Navy SEALs that are running for office, Congress. Mm. There's three special forces guys that I know of, and I hope those numbers keep going up. And the reason I say that is not because we're incorruptible or we're any better you know, or anything like that. The reason I say that is because for one reason only, if you are willing to die for it, it's harder to sell it out. That's, That's it. So good. Doesn't mean you won't just mean it. It's harder to sell it out if you were w- actually willing to die for it. Wow. So I'm glad to see that, um, you know, my, my primary, if I have one will be in August and then the general election is in November. If anybody wants to go support us in our campaign, uh, we're asking for three things. We're asking for prayer. We're asking for donations. And we're ha- asking for help. Um, excuse me. This uh, this carbonated water that I'm drinking is is causing me to burp. And we're, you know, and we're asking for help sharing our website and just, you know, sharing our story and our message with uh, with people out there. And I, I if you knew like if if you knew me, you know, personally, you know that I, I would never ask you for money i would probably never even ask you for help if i could avoid it that's not me it's not it's not my style I, I it may be a little too proud maybe that's something i also need to work on but unfortunately in this world um it all comes down to name recognition name recognition if people don't know who you are when they see your name on a ballot they won't they can't vote for you they won't vote for you yeah. and they'll times just check the box of the person that they've you know that has been yeah. there for six or 10 or 20 years because you go with what you know and uh, unfortunately when you're dealing with uh, you know swaths of your state that are that large like 750,000 people it takes a lot of money to run digital ads television ads mailer Mm -hmm. ads all of that so that people know who you are what your name is what your platform is and see if they identify with you I say all that to say if you guys are willing to go to eliforarizona.com and, uh, you know, throw us a small donation. We'd really appreciate that. And if you're willing to tell others about our campaign and, you know, even the other, like right now you're in Texas, you got Morgan Latrell running in Texas. Mm-hmm. He's a Marcus, Marcus Latrell's brother. Right. We got Brady Duke. He's a seal. I know him. He's running in Florida. He's a minister. He's a great guy. Um, Derek Van Orden is running up in Wisconsin. Mm-hmm. Um, so you got you got all those all those guys right there, and then you got Sean Parnell running for Senate. He's a Army um, officer, and then you've got one of my favorites is a guy named uh, I think is Joe Kent. He's yeah. running up in Washington. He's a Special Forces guy. Mm. I think he's one of the smartest dudes I've 
I've heard interviewed. I have never met him, but I'm just trying to give you guys, yeah. you know, not that we should ever really hope in this world, but hope that there's still people that want to fight for yeah. what we have and what many of us have taken for granted and yeah. what many, and many, what many have died for. So yeah, yeah Arizona, if you guys want to com, if you want to learn more about our campaign. That's so, oh, that's good, man. And, and I'll just reinforce your point because when you said we need more special operations, former military, you know, and, and Christians on top of that. So I would say you guys are known for doing the hard things. And we all know that Washington can be one of the hardest climates to try to drive change in, uh, in the world. So I, I will say, yes, you guys have faced way harder opposition than what you will face in Washington. So we, uh, we, we, I speak for the audience when I say thank you for your service. Uh, thank you for getting your name in the hat and really jumping in with both feet in this political arena to drive change and making it about something bigger than yourself, which you just said. And uh, I, I want to say it's been an honor to have you. It's been an honor to meet you. Um, audience, go to uh, to his website and support in whatever way you can. And uh, till next time, he's been Eli Crane. We've been last in line. Be blessed.